Good morning. I'm all in. Are you all in? Chuck, thank you for the shout out. I hope you feel the same way after this sermon. Got uh, a lot of folks here to hear what I have to say about divorce. Uh, series on marriage typically doesn't include lessons on being single or being divorced, but I think it's important that we broach the topic. You know, I'm a country music fan, and one of my favorite country artists of all time is the legend, George Strait. And among the myriad of hits that George Strait has churned out in his, what did you say? <laughs> you know who George Strait is, right, Archie? No? Okay. This is going to be right over your head, okay? <laughs> Among the myriad of hits that, that George Strait has churned out over his career, one of my all-time favorites is All My Exes Live in Texas. You remember that song? Rosanna's down in Texarkana, wanted me to push her broom. Sweet Eileen's in Abilene, she forgot I hung the moon. It's a lighthearted, comical commentary on a very weighty subject. And the truth of the matter is, divorce is kind of like cancer. We all know of somebody who has been touched by it, if we haven't been touched by it personally. And the truth of the matter is, it is not comical or lighthearted for anyone who has experienced it. In fact, it's rather serious. I'm not going to bombard you with statistics this morning. I'm not going to dwell on the problem. We all know that divorce runs rampant in our culture. And I want to spend my time this morning trying to unscramble an egg. I don't think that's my job. And I'm not really going to take a deep dive into all the doctrinal ins and outs of divorce and remarriage. So if that's what you were hoping for, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I think that's a a lesson for another time, and quite honestly, I think those lessons are best served in a Bible class because so many times when you preach on a topic like that and you get involved into all the doctrinal details, you leave with more questions than you do answers, it seems like. But what I do want to do is encourage those who have been through a divorce, and I think we need a more redemptive approach. I've heard too many horror stories of divorced individuals who discovered that the church was the last place that they could turn for help. I am thankful that Walnut Street is not such a place. And I hope that all of our members and all of you who are visiting this morning know that this is a place where you will be loved. And that no matter what you have gone through, even if it's blatantly your fault, we're going to love you through it and help you as best we can. Amen. I want to start this morning with some truth. And actually, this entire lesson will be based in truth. But I want to start with a truth this morning that may be hard for some of you to hear. But I want you to stick with me, okay? Don't tune me out just yet. Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 13. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one who has done so has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So here's the hard truth. God hates divorce. And if you are divorced, this may not be your favorite passage of Scripture. However, I believe that it's vital for all divorced folks, as well as all individuals, to notice what the Holy Spirit did not say here. 
The Holy Spirit did not say, I hate the divorced. He says, I hate divorce. And do you know why God hates divorce? Because he loves people. And he knows what divorce does to people. There's depression and emptiness and heartbreak and shame and failure and bitterness and hurt. Divorce, even on scriptural grounds, which I hate that term, scriptural divorce, I can't stand that term. But anyway, even on scriptural grounds is preceded by broken promises, broken hearts, and consummates in a broken home. Divorce is grief without a death. And that's why God hates it. Because he loves people. And it's important to understand the bigger context of Malachi. You know me, I'm a stickler for looking at the context surrounding a passage because that's the only way you get the bigger picture. And we've talked about this in a sermon recently, but also in our series on the Minor Prophets, we discussed this in Malachi and what is going on surrounding this verse in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. It is an abject apathetic attitude among the people that shrugs their shoulders, throws their hands in the air, and says, so what? That was the attitude of the people in this day and age. What difference does it make anyway? I mean, what's the big deal? That was the problem, the attitude with the people, and that is what is behind all these accusations that God levies against his people. This attitude affected their worship. It affected their relationships. We see it with the poverty and corruption that was present among the rulers. It affected their marriages as well. God called them out for their blatant disregard for the marriage covenant. It affected their giving even. Their whole lives were polluted and their only response was, so what? What difference does it make? God's people are bringing their polluted lives before the Lord and then weeping and groaning because God rejected them. They did as they pleased, blatantly disregarding the Lord and his commands. They even soaked the altar with their tears and God says that's not good enough. God even makes reference to the marriage covenant as the overall covenant with his people. The marriage covenant is serious business, but the people had treated it as if, as, as if it was disposable. You see, what, what is in view here is man marrying a woman, but having his eye on somebody else. And he would stay married to her as long as he wanted to until he wanted to move on to somebody who he thought would please him more. God often used the marriage covenant as a metaphor for the type of relationship he had with his people. They were his bride, but they were unfaithful. They stepped outside of the covenant and committed spiritual adultery by worshiping idols. They broke the covenant. And the capricious divorce that was taking place in Malachi's time was symbolic of the breaking of the covenant with God, which prompted the words, I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. God had been faithful to his people, to his bride, over and over again. But his bride said, get lost. I have found somebody else. I've got my eye on someone else. God's people had made a mess of their lives. They had been unfaithful in their marriages, in their covenant with God, and yet they still expected God to bless them. And it's as if God is saying, really? Are you serious? Like you bring your polluted lives before the altar and you want me to bless you? So that is the bigger context. That's what's going on in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. And it's very, very similar to what is happening in Matthew chapter 19. Turn there for, with me. Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 3, we see that the people had made a mockery of their covenant with their bride, the covenant of marriage, but they'd also made a mockery of their covenant with God. So notice verse 3, some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. 
But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Who, he who is able to accept this, let him accept it. So Jesus is answering a loaded question. A trap has been set by the Pharisees, the religious leaders. It is no coincidence that this trap is set in the region of Perea. This was a region governed by Herod Antipas. And do you remember what happened just prior to these words? Herod Antipas had John the Baptist beheaded because he spoke out against his unlawful marriage. And so this trap is being set in the hopes that perhaps Jesus will be caught in a quandary and Herod will remove his head as well. Here's the loaded question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Well, that's a question that deserves a little more detailed response, right? Especially when you consider the circumstances surrounding it. If you're going to study Matthew chapter 19 and derive a theology from it, then you'd better go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24 because everything in Matthew 19 centers on Deuteronomy 24. I say everything, at least the heart of the questioning and the answering here, okay? So look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, starting in verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. And she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled for that is an abomination before the Lord and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. So a couple of things here. First and foremost, it was always assumed that the divorced woman would get remarried. That was always assumed because she had to, right? In order to be taken care of, she had to get married. And so that's why Moses allowed for a certificate of divorce because these men were marrying a lot of different women and not putting them away and God is saying, or excuse me, Moses is saying, just give the woman a certificate of divorce so she can move on and marry somebody that would take care of her. So first of all, it was assumed she would remarry. Secondly, the man was not allowed to return to his first wife. That's interesting. We a lot of times teach the opposite, don't we? The whole controversy centered on the interpretation of the phrases, finds no favor in his eyes, and found some indecency in her. Now, there were three prominent rabbis at the time. You had Rabbi Hillel, who taught that you could divorce a woman for any reason whatsoever. The, the illustration that was often used is if she burned the dinner. You could divorce her for any reason. Then you had Rabbi Shammai, who taught that divorce was only allowable where immorality or adultery had taken place. So he saw indecency as immorality or sexual sin. Then you had Rabbi Akiva, who taught that you could divorce your wife if you found someone prettier to marry. And he focused on the finds no favor in his eyes portion of the statement. So Jesus is being asked to pick one. And it was assumed that whatever side he chose, he was going to alienate a large portion of the population. Now, most people at this time sided with Rabbi Hillel, who taught that divorce was allowable for any reason whatsoever. And they were pretty sure that Jesus would not take that position. And by choosing a side that didn't cooperate with the rest of the thinking of that day and time, he would put himself in a really precarious position. So the trap has been set, but Jesus didn't take the bait. He responds by going back to the very beginning. He skips past Deuteronomy chapter 24 and the law because they were abusing it anyway. 
and he goes all the way back to Genesis, to the institution of marriage, when the marriage covenant was pure and unadulterated, before it was perverted by men who treated it as disposable. And from the beginning, divorce was not a part of the plan. A man and a woman were joined and became one for all of life without any separation other than death. Of course, this was not the answer that the Pharisees expected. They knew that while there was no accommodation for divorce in the beginning, Moses had allowed for it. Therefore, they asked Jesus, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now, not to get too far off track here, but as I stated a moment ago, this all centers around, this certificate of divorce centers around the fact that many men were marrying many women and moving on and they found someone prettier or someone they liked better and they would just dispose of their wife. And Moses, of course, is saying, give them a certificate of divorce so that they can move on and find someone who will take care of them. If you don't want her anymore, then at least give her a certificate of divorce. Now, we often look at Matthew 19, we in the church, and we focus on the remarriage part, which is the opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus focuses on the marriage part. We often focus on the remarriage His focus was on marriage, and this is the signature text for the doctrine we affectionately refer to as MDR, right? Marriage, divorce, remarriage. And that's a doctrine that's filled with a lot of controversy, depending on who you talk to. Many have different views. But there's a whole lot more to what Jesus is saying here that often gets overlooked. Like the rabbis of Jesus' day, there are many different views and interpretations. I have seen this subject mishandled in the church over and over again. There's often two extremes, right? One extreme is you can get divorced for any reason because it doesn't really matter. And the other extreme takes the two exceptions, adultery and death, and turns them into some sort of new legalism. Both positions miss the heart of what Jesus said about marriage and divorce and I grieve I grieve how some have been treated in the church who have been divorced some who have been refused baptism some who have been refused membership because as I know of one eldership said if we don't have video evidence of your spouse cheating on you then we can't allow you to be a member here Things like this have happened in our fellowship, unfortunately. Before we go applying Matthew chapter 19 as some universal, one-size-fits-all standard for every marital dilemma, let's be sure to zero in on what Jesus is teaching here. He's emphasizing the covenant of marriage. He doesn't deny that Moses allowed for divorce. He tells them that the reason was because of the hardness of their hearts. However, notice that Jesus concludes that statement with a reaffirmation of his previous teaching. He states, but from the beginning, it has not been this way. Jesus is saying marriage is God-made, divorce is man-made. God instituted marriage, man devised a way out of it. Jesus is telling those who are listening that day, and us, I believe as well, that marriage is God's creation, not man's. And since God designed and established marriage, he has the authority to set the rules. And men and women have no right to treat this most sacred human relationship in a self-directed manner. It's not our job. Our responsibility is to follow. Marriage is the most sacred human relationship. To treat it as anything less than such is to violate the will of God. So Jesus is redefining marriage for the people and for us in the process, one man, one woman for life. That was the original intent. Marriage shouldn't have an exit strategy. That is the overall teaching found in Matthew chapter 19. Instead of always looking for a way out, glorify God by staying in. It's kind of like Henry Ford the creator of the first affordable automobile, he was once asked, what is the secret to a long-lasting marriage? And he said, stick to one model. But, but, there is ideal and there is real. Even in the most ideal environment, there is a reality that must be confronted 
And even within the Lord's church, even among Christians, divorce is an issue. Marriages end. And there are men and women who are guilty as sin. And there are men and women who never, ever wanted to wear the label divorced. While Jesus said, what God has joined together, let no man separate, we know that couples do separate. And while Jesus allowed an exception, that of fornication, that doesn't mean that he wouldn't rather the couple work it out. But at the end of the day, there are broken marriages that will never be put back together. Then what? Then what? What is the divorced Christian to do? And sadly, as I've already mentioned, the one who never wanted the divorce is sometimes treated as if he or she is the guilty party, by Christians no less. I've heard horror stories from Christians within the church. I've learned that some people sought love and support from the very people they thought that they would find it in, and unfortunately it wasn't there. Look, elders shouldn't be in the bedroom. They're not private investigators. It's not their job to unscramble an egg. Church leaders have two main responsibilities. Number one, to uphold God's standard, and number two, to build up those who fail to meet it. And it is my contention that we need a more redemptive approach when it comes to divorce. Even the guilty party needs a place to worship. Even the most heinous sinner needs a place to worship. Paul said he was the chief of sinners and God used him, right? God will always exalt the ideal, but he will always stoop down to the hurting. And we have all needed God to stoop down. Jesus always upheld the ideal, but he always recognized the real. How do we take Jesus, who always took the side of the oppressed, and turn him around and use him to oppress? But we do that at times. When ideal intersects real, that's where grace steps in. And as I said a moment ago, God hates divorce. He doesn't hate the divorced. God is on the side of the hurting, the broken, the wounded, and therefore we had better be on their side as well. That doesn't mean that we compromise the truth. Not at all. I heard one minister talk about the touchy subject of divorce this way. He said, you've just got to decide, are you going to be a church that is a stickler for doctrine or are you going to be a church that shows compassion? And he goes on to say, as for our church, we decided to show compassion. I'm sorry, but that's a terrible false dichotomy. We should always be about conviction and compassion. The two go hand in hand, right? We can uphold God's ideal while lovingly supporting the, the, the real. And I, I want to use the truth to help heal people. We should all want that. We need to take a redemptive approach in everything that we do, even if that approach requires some tough love at times. The goal is always the same, to help an individual heal emotionally, mentally, perhaps physically, but of course spiritually. Amen. So, with that in mind, I want to offer some loving advice to all of those who have been divorced Perhaps those who never, ever wanted to be referred to as an ex. Please listen to me for a few moments. First of all, I would encourage you to choose better over bitter. Years ago, I had a woman come and sit in my office, and she was angry. She was mad at her ex-husband. She, she was mad at every man in the world. We talked about this a few weeks ago in our series on forgiveness, that whatever fills you is going to spill out when you get bumped. So if you're filled with bitterness and anger and malice and wrath, when you get bumped, that's what's going to spill out. And God wants to clean up the inside so that what spills out when you're bumped is good things. Well, this, this young lady was, was spilling out bad things. Nobody wanted to be around her because she was so bitter and so angry. And she sat in my office and, and, and she, she poured out her feelings of resentment and anger at all men because of her divorce. And I said, how many men hurt you? And she said, well, one. And I said, how many men are there in the world? And she understood my point. 
Choose better over bitter. Don't allow a divorce to keep you from being who God intended for you to be. Secondly, I would say this. Choose disciple over divorced. I've said it a lot of times in this series, but you are not identified by your marital status. You are a disciple. That's where your identity lies in who you belong to, not who you are married or not married to. You are not an ex. You are not damaged goods. You are a child of God. And I understand that society is constantly trying to put us into a box or a category, but society doesn't define you. God defines who you are. Know that discipleship is at your core. For anyone who may get lost in the world's categorization of individuals, remember these words, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When you choose Christ, you choose redemption, and you are given a new identity. Don't ever forget that who you are is defined by whose you are. Don't let someone who didn't die for you define you. And lastly, I would say this. Choose renewal over removal. And don't choose what's easy here. Because the easy thing to do when you've gone through tragedy is to pull away from the church and pull away from God. I've seen this over and over again in ministry. Somebody is going through a difficult time in life when they need the church the most is when they pull back. Don't choose what's easy. Divorce is difficult. And yes, people in the church can make it more difficult, but that's on them, right? I feel confident in saying these are people that will love you through whatever you're going through. Walnut Street is different. I believe that. So don't choose what's easy. Don't remove yourself from the situation. I know you feel guilt. I know you may feel shame. I know you, you're, you're hurt. And there's so much collateral damage surrounding divorce. But divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Renew your vows with God. For better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health, He is not going anywhere. And if you never ever wanted to wear that label of divorce, but yet here you are, Choose to draw closer, not further away. A couple had bought a house for the purpose of flipping it. They were going to remodel it and then put it back on the market. And there was one feature in this home that had to go. It was this very old, ornate mirror. was hanging on the wall and it had to come down. But it was very hard to get it down. Try as they may, it just wouldn't come off the wall. It had been bolted in, I guess, and had this adhesive around it. It became very clear that in order to get this this mirror off the wall, they were probably going to have to take out the wall. It was not going to be a clean separation. Divorce is not a clean separation. There's nothing about it that's clean and neat and tidy. It's difficult. And unfortunately, there isn't a magic pill, there isn't any five-step process or, or magical formula to getting over divorce. It takes time to repair what has been destroyed. But my encouragement to those who are in the rebuilding stage is to choose better over bitter, choose disciple over divorced, and choose renewal over removal. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for redemption. We thank you for hope, and we thank you that no matter what our lot is right now in our lives, that we have hope. We thank you that there is redemption. We thank you there is forgiveness, there's grace, there's mercy. And God, we thank you that this life isn't all that there is. Help us as we move forward from whatever it is that we've been dealing with. If it's a divorce, help us to rally around one another, to love and support, to help us to heal so we can get to a better place. And more than anything, God, no matter what we're going through, may we always look to you for guidance and direction. 
God, we love you. We thank you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.